Welcome back into another edition of Head Coach U. I am Brian Fisher, joined as always by Bronco Mendenhall, the former BYU and Virginia head coach. And Bronco, another special guest on for this week, at Utah State head coach Blake Anderson. Blake, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be here. Good to be here. Well, we, we, when uh, Bronco and I were, were starting this podcast, I, I think you were one of the first guests that uh, we, we definitely wanted to, to have on. And, and, and before we kind of get into the, the meat of the conversation today, I, I know you guys were, were on staff together. Do, do you have any good Bronco stories uh, from, from your days back in the in, back then? Wow. Well, this, is, this is probably where I need to interject. And I, I, I there's a disclaimer. Before Blake came on, he said he would not share anything whatsoever that would be negative in any way, which is probably the oh. only stories that he had. So that 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 probably ends that segment. <laughs> no, I, I had a blast coaching with Bronk. You know, that was my first Division One job. I uh, I still don't know how I got on that staff. Bronco was already there, and Rocky. I think Rocky just was tired of interviewing people. I mean, literally, he like let's just give the guy the job. He, I was driving him crazy. Uh, but uh, man, we we hit it off really well. We've got a lot of things that are that are um, a lot of things that we both kind of hold dear to us that are very similar. Both love our families, and we love to be outside and do stuff. We played a lot of golf together, played played hoops together, did a little bit of everything, you know, um, and just really appreciated how he did his job. We just became really good friends. He and Holly were very, very close with uh, myself and my first wife before she passed. And one of the things I'll tell you, I'm not going to embarrass him, but of all the things that I've been through in my life, Bronco's one of those guys I could always count on Bronco reaching out and just lifting me up when I was really struggling. And, He's done that a lot through my career and done a lot lately, and I've appreciated it more than people would would, would imagine. One of the things that um, is near and dear to me, uh, and and maybe the the primary reason for this podcast, right, is to try to share topics and people with others that have made a difference to me or have dealt with things that um, are significant that would add lots of value um, to others. And and Blake is a, a, a man of faith, but also a man of substance in so many different areas. And my son, Breaker, uh, was at Utah State, and Blake happens to then show up and be the head coach. And and we have some unique stories that way. Um, but Holly and I just so appreciated to now see the see um, college football from the lens of parents um, and a program being guided by someone of, of strong character and morals and values and we we weren't concerned that it was only going to be about outcome. We we actually believed that there was sincere uh, care um, for the individual. And man, I think in college football, it can easily shift to finance and outcome. But all of the right. real substance is in the relationships. And so we saw that. And then just knowing Blake and his story recently and, and some of his challenges and man, how well he's handled it um, and 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 just working through it. It just seemed really valuable for others to hear. So uh, I just really appreciate you coming on, Blake, and we're we're grateful. Oh, I'm glad to be here. I will tell you, man, when I walked in the door, the first meeting, and Breaker walked in, man, he was a pup. He was a pup when we were in New Mexico together. And if he don't look like his dad and walk <laughs> like his dad and run like his dad, I mean, it was – Every time I would just see him like running away from me, I was like, that is Bronco right there. Uh, I, I absolutely loved to get to be around him every day. It was kind of like this. It's kind of like we never, never left. It just kind of picked up where we left off. So it was, it was pretty cool to have him on the roster. And, and to Broncos credit, uh, you know, the reason, Blake, uh, we, we really wanted to have, have you on, you guys released a, a video uh, back in September, a very heartfelt message for, from you uh, for, about your late, late wife, Wendy, uh, and, and certainly your son, uh, Casey, who, who passed away in, in February. Uh, for, for those who maybe did not get a chance to, to see that, uh, I don't know if you could maybe uh, recap it a little bit, but uh, it was certainly a very touching message that, that I think uh, really impacted the rest of the college football community. You know, we we've. Um... We've been through a lot the last few years, definitely not by design, just the way that life works. Uh, none of it did we ask for it, but but that's that's where we're at. This most recent kind of challenge for us, I guess, is the best way to say it, um, you know, came at probably when, as a professional, as a head coach, probably at the highest point in my career, to be truthful, um, you know, my wife was diagnosed with cancer six years ago, I guess. Uh, we had a really long, very ugly battle with uh, a very aggressive 
a nasty form of breast cancer. It was, it was not, it was a very difficult challenge, very difficult road, very ugly, visible um, battle. And, and, and we lost that. It took about three years for, uh, for us to lose that battle. And, and so that was kind of the first real, real adversity that we'd hit as a family. I mean, typical adversity that any head coach does, moving from town to town, picking your kids up, good years, bad years, all that. But, but I'd say we've been really, really blessed uh, to, to be a head coach, to be in the profession, to have great people around us, had some pretty successful years, won some championships. And in the scheme of things, you know, just felt like that, that we'd been really, really fortunate. That hit us in a way that just really didn't know what to do with it. Um, as I mentioned in the video, I'm probably not that dissimilar from a lot of guys my age that grew up in in football. And my dad was a bull rider. Actually, my brother was a bull rider. So I, I grew up on the ranch. I was either at a rodeo every Saturday night or at a football or basketball game or baseball game. I and mean, that's just what we did. That was life for us with sports. And uh, some of them pretty – physical and violent sports. And I grew up in the area in the, and in a house that you just, I mean, you taped it up and, and you got up and you figured it out and, and you just, you didn't let see people see that you hurt. Uh, I think I've been that same person as a father and as a coach most of my career. And, and that's, I admit that very sadly. It, it, now looking back, having lost my son to suicide six months ago, um, I did not help him the way, I should have. I didn't know. I, I didn't really have the tools. I just was being the guy I've always been. Um, life's going to be unfair. Life's going to be hard. And we have to pick ourselves up and move through it. And, and I mean, we've always taken the same approach. I lean on my faith in Christ. I'm a firm believer in Christ. It's really the peace that I get is knowing that when I lost my wife, that it, you know, the second she took her last breath, she was in the presence of Christ, I feel the same way when I lost my father. Um, and I feel the same way having lost my son, but, and that is a sense of peace. It doesn't make the pain or the grief any less. Uh, there's just, there is that underlying peace knowing that, you know, I'll, I'll see him again. But I, I, I sadly admit that most of my life, all the way up till probably this tragedy of losing him, I just really didn't understand mental health in a, in a way that, that it's now become an everyday conversation and, and my own mental health, how I'm dealing with grief, uh, my kids, my players, my staff. Uh, and that's sad to say, I, and I would assume that across the country, we have a lot of coaches and a lot of fathers that have taken the same approach that it's just the way we grew up. And it's, it's something that's got to change. It absolutely has to change. We're going to lose too many people. Um, as I share in the story, and I hope people will go find it because I, I really just share it from my heart. It's it's on our, it's on our website and um, it's on our social media. I think it's, it's been seen over a million times at this point, and I know God's using it. The thing that that, really, I tried to get across was there were no huge warning signs. There was not this red flag or just obvious, um, you know, just sign or, or hint that, that my son was struggling like he was. I mean, he's like any other kid had lost his mom. I mean, he, he had grief. He missed his mom. He, he'd gone through a breakup with a girlfriend. He, we'd lost his grandfather, my, my bro, my brother and his uncle who he loves to death had gotten a bad diagnosis. But I mean, through the midst of all that, we talked every couple of days. He talked to his brother almost every night. They played PlayStation, you know, till two in the morning, about half the time, which, you know, I was always telling him to get some sleep, you know, and, and, but that's the world we live in. But he was always really quick to tell me, man, I'm doing great. Dad, I'm fine. I mean, I love you. He was the most affectionate of all my kids. He was the, he would never miss an opportunity to tell you, Hey, I love you. He would never miss an opportunity to hug your neck. He was the most sarcastic, funniest, biggest smile in the room which he got some of that sarcastic stuff honestly from our our whole family is huge sarcastic joke makers and he was the best of all of us uh he never let anybody know just what he was dealing with and carrying behind the scenes and so you know to me my conversations i would leave him thinking man he's doing good i'm proud of him he's he's moved in uh, to an apartment he's got a job he's he's finished school he's 
on with a career. He's, you know, he's gone through life like a lot of us, but he's really, he's doing well. He even, he even went as far to tell his sister a couple of weeks earlier. I've, you know, I've seen a grief counselor and man, it helped a lot. I've, I've never been better. I read his text messages off his phone. I've never been better. And, and just two weeks later, you know, in the middle of the night, he, he chose to take his life. So the scariest part for me of this whole thing is it's, it's invisible. It's silent. It's, it's, it's really quiet. It's very subtle. And I can look back now, Bronk, and I can see a text message from weeks before. I can, I can think about a conversation that we had that maybe in its own way, suddenly he was, he was trying to let me know that, that there was more there and I couldn't see it. And that's the thing that scares me. I mean, the, the guys that I come across that wear it on their sleeve, that you can see it visibly, that's one thing. But how many people are we around every day? Those that we really love. I mean, I, that we just, we don't, they don't let us in because they don't want to burden us with their problems or they don't, they don't want to seem vulnerable or weak, but that's what they've been taught. That's unfortunately, that's what we've taught. And, um, this has woken me up to a point where I know I've got to change. I've got to, I've got to be transparent and vulnerable in front of my kids, in front of my staff, in front of my players, in really in front of anybody that's watching my platform and, and let them know it's okay to not be okay. Um, and that's really why I wanted to visit, you know, just really willing to have this conversation. It's raw, it's real, and I'm hurting in a way that it's hard to explain. But God's got to find some purpose in the pain. The the, um, the sincerity, authenticity, and transparency, um, but the the realness. Um, I shared a statement one time that sometimes something has to happen for something to happen, and that can be personally in our lives, or it can be in a program. But but what what you've gone through? I, I remember visiting with our athletic director at, at Virginia. And 750 athletes in that athletic program, uh, we had two sports psychologists, over half, over half of all athletes were seeing our sports psychologists. And, and so he, here's this, these leadership positions that, that you and I have been blessed with, and I'm now talking sport, but now let's expand it to families and, and being parents. And, and then the cultural norms, as you described, that, that you're kind of, I don't know, expected with, or they become part of you. And then there's this outcome-driven pressure, at least in football, but sometimes right, young people are feeling outcome-driven anyway, either to, for whatever reason, right, to fit in a family or hit a certain mark by a certain time in their life. And, and how in the world, right, um, can we be intentional enough to look and then live in a way that we can see? And, and that to me is just, um, when, I, when I listened and heard your, your story, um, it's transformative because I want to live in a way where I can see, right? I can see others' burdens. I can see their challenges, whether they're in my own family, uh, on a team that I coach, or just anyone I care about. And and I also uh, um, instruction, right? And and I would love to hear, you know, as you're going through this, how how was your messaging to your team different, or or how was the awareness, or or how are you even trying to build that in, or um, or even go about it? You know, I think the first thing is just being willing to be vulnerable in front of them. Um, being willing to stand in front of a group of, of guys that, that you're trying to lead and, and cry in front of them and, and, and be brokenhearted in front of them and just let them see you. I mean, really at your most vulnerable, at your, at your lowest point. Um, I thought that's where it needed to start. And, and I've been very, very open with them. Um, I shared my testimony and, and kind of our story with them before I was willing to share it with anybody else. Now the video that I put out, I wasn't really sure I was ready to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the first time that I really spoke about our story and what actually happened to Kaysen. And, you know, everybody knew that we'd lost him, but nobody really knew how. And, and it, it took months for me to be able to, to process it enough where I felt like I could even verbalize it in a way that would make, would, would do it justice and, 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 and really uh, be the most helpful. But part of it is, is leading by example too, Brock. I, I didn't feel like I could, I didn't feel like I could ask guys in our room 
to to stand up and share their testimony and show their weakness and and show their hurt and show their pain uh, or, or even what they've overcome if I wasn't willing to do that first. And, and mm-hmm. so we had talked about having, you know, kind of a mental health initiative. We, we always obviously all realized that it, it was important. A bunch of guys in the room and staff members as well had indicated, Coach, this is something we want to dedicate some time to. This is not just because you lost Kaysen, but it obviously brought everything full circle for a lot of us, I think. And it just threw it in our face in a way that 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 we needed desperately. I hate that that was the catalyst to get us to a point where we're really willing to act. But but at the end of the day, that's what it was. It mm-hmm. it made it so uh, in our face and so you know relevant that we had we had to do something. Yeah. Um, and I didn't feel like I could ask my staff and my players to do anything in terms of therapy or service. Uh, or proactive steps that I wasn't willing to take personally. And, you know, that's where that, that's where that testimony started. I, I, and I said in the beginning, I just feel like there's no better place to start than with me. Yeah. Uh, it allowed some other guys in the room to open up. I think that maybe wouldn't have before. Obviously the platform that God's given us and the people that are watching, it's, it's been seen by millions of people and that's, that's God using, you know, this for a purpose in, in the midst of pain, he is using it to help others. And the emails and the messages and the texts and the phone calls that are coming in on a daily basis re, you know, reaffirm to me that, that God's in control of this, that as much as I miss Keith and, and I can't get him back, that other people are going to come to know Christ and other people are going to come to find help mm-hmm. through our pain. And, and that, that is, that is the goal. Uh, to change, change behavior, mm-hmm. change our answers, uh, change the way we think about mental health. In, in, mm-hmm. you know, overall, that it is out of our control. Uh, and I'm dealing with it right now with grief. There's, yeah. there's times that it is, it is so heavy, it's hard to breathe. Mm-hmm. And I know it's not my fault. I know it's not in my control. It is something I have to learn to process and I have to learn to carry and still do life. I got a lot of life left to live. And I got people counting on me and people that need me to be the best version of myself through the grief that, that I now have to carry. And if it's not grief, maybe it's depression. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's all those things. And, and we have to change. And, and so um, the first step for me was to take action myself. Yeah. And, and it has been somewhat therapeutic too. I'll, I'll say this: there is a sense of therapy in sharing case and story. There's a sense of release of mm-hmm. of some of that to see it help other people. And I think it's also opened the opportunity for some of the guys that were really struggling to take that first step. Um, I think it's helped them, and in that sense, it's been it's been beneficial. You know, so many of us, there, 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 there has to be a felt need at a certain level created before we act. And there's different thresholds of what that'll be. And, and life events sometimes hit that felt need where significant change happens. And a lot of times we don't even know how to change other than something has to be different. And I think that what you're sharing is so many leaders, right? Leaders go first and that makes you really vulnerable but yet I think it galvanizes relationships. And when you go through hard things together, man, there, there's relationships and bonds that go deeper than outcome only. Yeah. And you and I are, are involved in a platform that keeps shifting further and further toward outcome only. And, and then that defines, if you allow it to, your self-worth. And so how many snaps are you playing? Are you a starter or are you a backup? Were you the conference champion or were you, did you lose to your, what, whatever your metrics are, if you're not careful, that can almost be claimed as an identity. And wow, is that a limiting uh, because yeah. so much more that we are other than what we do. And I, I think that um, as, I don't know if it was like this for you, but I'd go through the locker room pregame and I'd, I would hear players throwing up before the game, right? They're, they're so anxious and so nervous. And, and uh, in a way, I thought, wow, is, is that cool how important this is to them? 
at the same time, I was sad that, wow, that that's the level of coping that they currently have to do something they're supposed to love to do. And yet it's surrounded by this, this, um, getting sick, right? Yeah, <laughs> getting sick. Yeah. It's, and so on a, on a much, much larger scale and, and significance is what you're talking about. And somehow there's, there has to be a way to develop and grow and build young people through these amazing challenges and, and leadership spots that we've been given to help. And I think that your message of vulnerability and transparency and showing that that's really what um, capable and caring leaders do is really a conduit that could help. Yeah. I mean, I think we're really lucky to get to do life through football. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun when you're winning and picking up trophies. I get that, but there's not a better place to teach life than mm -hmm. through the ups and downs of, of what happens, <clears throat> you know, in, in our day to day in the locker room environment. I mean, you, you break down every racial and ethnical background, you know, barrier. You got guys that would have never crossed paths before coming from all over the country. And our locker room is crazy in terms of the diversity and just from, from really from every way you might break down our culture, you get them all in a room and then you watch how they do galvanize through, through a loss, through mm -hmm. a loss of a parent, through a loss of a coach's son, I cannot tell you how many young men on our roster walk in my office on a daily basis still today just to walk in and say, Coach, how are you today? Hug mm -hmm. my neck. Come get a honey bun or an oatmeal cream pie out of the snack closet and just say, Coach, how are you? How many how many of these guys send me a, a song or a prayer or a, or a text? Man, just thinking about you tonight, Coach, before I go to bed. And mm – -hmm. Man, we all want to win at the highest level. We, we're all built competitive. God built us this way for a reason. But I think the lessons that we're that we're learning along the way, whether it's through raising a trophy or coming up short and failing and learning how to fail forward, or really dealing with real life that supersedes any game and any opponent, mm -hmm. is just uh, you know it's a blessing to get to do it, but it's also a huge responsibility not to not to waste that opportunity and just focusing on how many games you win. And, I, and I'll be honest, Bronk, you, you know me, you know my pretty much, I, I got it wrong the first half of my career. I really did. Uh, I didn't, I didn't acknowledge the platform that God gave me uh, really to the extent that I should. I got caught up in chasing the world's view of how things were. And I was all dead set on moving up the profession. And I was, I was moving up and moving up relatively quickly for a young guy. And, and, you know, I've shared my testimony as well about how I kind of had to hit rock bottom personally uh, and, and really step away from coaching for a, a year and a half to get perspective because I I really just had chased it the wrong way. I wasn't using the platform. I was yeah. I was using it for me. I was using it for my personal gain. And I'm really fortunate that I had an amazing wife who prayed me through it and, and didn't quit on me. And God gave us a second chance. I got back into coaching. We started putting – God first, family second, football third, and had way more fun coaching the last 15 years with that, with mm -hmm. with my uh, priorities being in the right place. Mm -hmm. And I, I've really been so fortunate to get to see so many young coaches on my staff, young players on my staff, um, benefit from God shining through and, and us doing adversity in life together leaning on him and leaning on each other. And this has just been another, you know, another one of those uh, times that, that I've needed it. Yeah. I've leaned on our staff and our players more over the last seven months than, than, you know, I care to really admit they've lifted me up. They turned mm -hmm. right back around and did for me what I've done for them in the past. And, and it's, it's, it's allowing me to, to get up and show up every day, even when it's not always my best. You know, I, I've learned so much um, in my career about leadership through followership. And as you're saying, to have a, to a young person, right, a player on your team, carve out time out of his day to come up to the second floor or third floor corner office to then support a coach yeah. and a leader. Those moments are, are the most special and cherished moments. And here's the leader being comforted and learning from um, – 
someone else that's younger, less experienced, but deeply and intently committed to helping someone yes. else. And, and so in this world of competitive football, there's a huge avenue for helping others. And I think the greatest coaches are those that help the most, right? Yeah. And, yeah. But also we can learn the most from young people that sometimes are even more advanced than we are about how they see the team, how they see each other. And many times they're more connected because they're immersed. Um, and it's easy to be separated as the head coach. And so many yeah. times I, I felt those moments, they were drawing me back into what's real. Uh, and I'm out of the film room and just go to sit in the locker room or being outside when they came out of the practice field and just staying there and visiting with whoever wanted to be there um, and listening and learning. And and so I've wrestled with much like much like you is how then to be more present and real for them about things that really matter. And so if you have 125 players on your team, right, having a one-on-one -on -one interview every day, you, you run out of time. However, if you're fiercely present and just paying attention, those that need you, it, it becomes clear if you can listen and see appropriately enough, but that has to be an intentional effort. Yeah. And I think you're clearly doing that. I know there are others are as well, but man, I think we could do more of that. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's funny when you, when you talk about that, I just, I picture in my mind the images of, um, you know, every afternoon spending 20 minutes down on the ping pong table with a few guys or on the pool table mm -hmm. or sitting on the couch in the locker room. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different ways to lead and, and, and everybody's going to lead the way that they feel comfortable. But I, I do believe that had if there wasn't a snack closet in my office, that guys have to, you know, make the walk of shame, if you, if you call it, to walk in and say, Coach, can I get a can I get some pop tarts? Can I get an oatmeal cream pie? I do that on purpose because I want them to have to walk into my office without feeling like I'm in trouble or coach is going to give me a lecture or I'm bringing some bad news to coach's desk. Just. I'm coming in. Hey, coach, can I get some? Uh, can I get some trail mix? You know that is a as a little thing that when I became a head coach that Wendy and I talked about. I said I want to spend money out of my our pocket. I want to I want to create a snack closet in my office for the guys, the GAs and the players to stick their head in and just say, Coach, can I grab something? I've been amazed at how many conversations that snack closet has created, and you know, it shows that the door is open, that it's okay to go down to the end of the hall and go see the head coach. It's not, you're, it's, it's not always got to be the principal's office. It's just mm -hmm. coach wants to know you. That's why we got a player's lines. That's why I'm in the player's lines every day playing ping pong or pool with one of the guys. Now I talk smack and I have a blast beating up on these guys, but it breaks down that barrier. Uh, they still know that at the end of the day, that, that if I got to hold them accountable and discipline them, I will. But there's a lot of hugs, a lot of tears, a lot of laughter, a lot of jokes. The locker room area, you know, is sacred ground. Mm -hmm. And the ability to sit on the couch and those guys feel comfortable being themselves with you being around them is huge. Because when life hits and, and they are hurting or you're hurting in a way that you don't, you never thought you could feel like that. You want them to feel just as comfortable walking in and closing the door and bearing their heart to you. And I don't know that you get one without the other, Bronk. I don't, I yeah. know there's a ton of different ways to lead. And maybe you've got to be that leader that's completely at arm's length and you only come in my office. I just, that's not the way God's led me to lead. Yeah. And Christ came to serve, not to be served. Mm -hmm. And if I take servant leadership, if I take that truly, to heart then I've got to be willing to serve my staff and my players as well. And, and you can do that and still be in control and still be the person that makes the final decision. It doesn't mean you have to be weak. You just have to be honest and open and transparent. And one of those things that I'm honest about is guys, if you cross the line, I'm going to whip your tail. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hold you accountable and you need to want me to, but it doesn't mean we can't have, a great loving relationship. I mean, my dad, I mean, he was my hero. I love my dad. Just, just ridiculous amount. He loved me. I knew it, but he did not waste. He did not wait a second to whip my butt when he needed to. 
Mm-hmm. But five minutes later, man, I, I remember being able to sit on the back porch with him or on the tailgate with him and have true open dialogue and conversation. And so I've tried to take that same approach as a leader. And I hope people, leaders that, that are what you know, young guys that are becoming coordinators and head coaches and into leadership roles in business, I hope they'll think, man, be yourself, be you. You can do it both. You can have both. It doesn't have to be all of one or the other. And I think it's one of the things I've learned the most over the last 10, 15 years is that I can be me. I can be open and transparent and honest and loving and caring and still be a disciplinarian and still discipline and hold people accountable. And, and I think that's really, really important. You know, Blake, I think I think the very best uh, people and best leaders are authentic and, and they're leading as part of them. They're not pretending. And, w- and when anyone pretends, right, it takes more time, energy and effort and it's not truthful and it's not moral. Right. And and so what a waste of time. If you pull that thread and why would someone pretend it's usually uh, from the praise of others? Like what do others think of them? Yeah. And, and, and that's giving away a sense of truth and identity that's inherent to who we are. And you can't ever satch. You can't ever please those that you can't ever please others. I, I listened to a quote one time when I first became a head coach from a, a a church leader that just I truly admired. And he said, it's not possible to please everyone, nor should it be your intent. And so you I, I remember. So there was a time I came into a locker room at the University of Virginia and I saw a player looking at his phone at halftime. And I paused for a second before I acted. And I just was like, what in the world? could be on that phone that would be so compelling that a young person would be drawn to see. And I think these young people are measuring themselves in attention capital, right? How many likes? Oh, from absolutely. Strangers. These are strangers, right? And and that's a fickle market, right? And, and so he was looking to see what people thought of his first half. And he doesn't even know him. So here are the coaches that love him and the team that's around him. And yet somehow his priority structure was set to value what others were thinking, but he didn't even know more than those that he was around. And I, I paused for a second before I even acted on that. And I, I was, I, I realized, wait, there there are foundational gaps in the development of these kids um, that we're losing the battle against of what they're, what they're, what they're truly valuing. And a, yeah. a, a and sincere and transparent relationship over values, even if there's one of those, my dad at one time told me, if you leave this world with just a couple true friends, you will be yeah. gifted and lucky. And I learned as a head coach, I thought my circle of friends would stand beyond measure. It went the other way. Yeah, of, of true friends, it went the other way. And, and so I, I think one of the things that's brilliant of what you've done is, is created your office. Cause we know psychological safety is, is essential for any, crew team where they have to be able to go into a space and it's a safe space. And if that can be in the head coach's office based on getting a, a snack, right? You're already creating a pattern that it's okay to go in. And then they're probably more likely to come in with the challenge because yeah. they've already been there so many times before. And, yeah. and so I love just the practical takeaway uh, for people of, of creating that space and a safe space to come on a daily basis if they choose I think that makes it more likely they'll come when they really need to to visit. Yeah, you know, you you touched on something. You know, we kind of started this conversation on mental health, and you touched on something that I think is a huge, huge issue in good mental health, and that is the effect that likes and bad comments, anonymous uh, comments. I mean, we deal with it as coaches. Mm-hmm. And I, I would oh, yeah. come out of a game and things didn't oh, go yeah. well. And I can promise you my email and my, my DMS are blowing up. I mean, and, yeah. you know, you're never as good as they say you are, but you're, you're definitely not as bad as they say you are either. And the ability to tear people down behind a tag, an anonymous mm-hmm. tag. I mean, it's happening to our players as well. God forbid a kicker miss a game winner or yeah. a quarterback throw an interception. And we dealt with that early in this year. We dealt with a quarterback that was struggling through an injury and trying to finish up his career and, you know, wasn't playing probably at the level that he really had shown he could play in the past. And and what he was seeing and hearing on a daily basis on his phone was, it's just vile. And, 
if that is your identity, if that if you let that tie into your identity, the ability to stay mentally healthy is is almost impossible. And and it's something I, I tell coaches on my staff, especially guys that I think are going to go on to be leaders and, and be head coaches. You've got to choose who you're going to be. You've got to choose how you're going to do it. It has to be authentic. It has to be what really you believe in your DNA down to your core. It doesn't need to be. You don't have to be Nick Saban. You don't have to be Dabo Sweeney. You don't have to be anybody but you. And you also need to understand that it might not work. You may fail at it. But that doesn't mean you are a failure. It just means in this particular time, this particular location, Maybe this wasn't right fit, the right timing, but some of the greatest to ever do anything, most of the, all of the greatest have failed along the way. And, I, and that's another message I try to, to put in front of my staff, and my players all the time. How many times Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, Kobe Bryant, Nick Saban, the greatest coach of all. I mean, look back at his tracker. He didn't get it right everywhere he was. Mm-hmm. He got fired just like the rest of us at some point in his career. You've got to be true to who you are and you can't let, all right, I know this is exactly how I'm going to do things. Yep. This is what I believe God's leading me to do and be. And if it doesn't work, guess what? He's going to pick me up, move me somewhere else. He's got something else in store. And somebody else will come in, maybe they'll get it right. You can't live you know, in the past of whether you didn't, you got to fail forward. And I think it's one of the, it's one of the biggest things as, as coaches and players and really just people in general in any phase of life. You've got to learn the skill of, of failing and failing forward, because if not, you will never try and get out of your comfort zone and let yourself expand your skill set, your knowledge base, uh, all those things. And, and, and a lot of what we're seeing on social media, do people like this? Are people okay with this? Is, is, is keeping that from happening or is making that such a challenge to, to be willing to fail? Because of the backlash is going to be so massive these days. Yeah. So I, I love, I also believe in the concept of falling forward. I, I promote the, the most wild and and um, uh, risky endeavors that someone truly tries. And the research is really clear about junior high, the, the, the pressure of others around you to for you to look silly trying something new. People stop at the junior high level trying new things because the pressure of looking bad in front of their peers. And, and so then folks start just sitting on the sideline or having their performance or a new skill or a new hobby that, that really will enhance their life. They, they won't do it in that setting because they're afraid of what people will think. Yeah. And um, I, I want to share a story. I've never shared this maybe publicly, but early on in my head coaching career, I was also getting those emails after a game uh, or there were comments, even at places that I didn't think it was appropriate, attending church and someone would want to talk about a game, right? And and so I, I, I answered every one of those negative emails starting out personally with an invitation to meet me and talk to me in person. Not a single person, not one. And I won't even say how long I did that for, but it was longer than what you would think. I'm talking more than a year not one ever showed up and at that point my wife and i committed never ever um be on social media even read the news or watch a broadcast if we watched a game or a rerun the the volume was off because what i realized is if we don't know who we are and if we're going to let someone else define us um we're really not modeling um, what we think is most important for young people. And, and I went to a seminar, I was struggling during that same time. And we were 11 and two and 11 and two and 10 and three and 11 and two. And I was miserable. And, and I was like, how in the world can this be? And so I went to a seminar and there was another head coach there, three other head coaches. And he said, while he was holding up the crystal ball, confetti's coming down, right? In that moment, he was thinking, there's got to be more than this. Yeah. And, and so even with the praise of the world, without true mental health and identity of who we are, what we are, and why we are, and that it's okay, um, and there's others to help us, you can't ever get that from anyone or from what the masses think. And, and somehow, back to what you were saying with 
the, the, the social media platform. Um, and I was able to, to kind of co-teach a, a class every year at Virginia um, to these uh, just wickedly smart and bright kids. And, and the book was called Irresistible. And it was talking about the addictive power of cell phones, right? And, and as a conduit and, and something like, right? By, by the time young people now are growing up, there's gonna be almost 30 years they've spent on the screen. Yeah. And, and I was thinking, what what in the world could be doing that? And if that if a if a large portion of that is being um devoted to what others think of us, and you and I experience that because we're very visible, but really how to protect, help, but also help these kids see how to combat that. And I share my story all the time. I was asking these people to come see me in person. Yeah. to talk about the comments that they wrote and they would not show. Yeah. And so I frame that to try to help my team of these, these um, uh, comments are, are not valuable nor real and they're to be discarded if you're even going to acknowledge them. And, and having that message get through, wow, was that a challenge? And so anyway. Well, it's, it's real. It's, and it's, it's not just in sports. It's just in, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm remarried now and God brought an amazing group of girls in my life. Uh, married Brittany a little over a year ago, got two little girls, 11 and six. And I just mm. think about their life at, mm. at you know, are they going to be, cause they are, you know, they're getting to that point where they're, they they want to be they're like every other 11 year old, six year old, they want to take pictures and they, they want to see how many people are going to like what they put out their dance, their picture, their artwork, whatever. I mean, you know, you and I didn't deal with this growing up. We mm -hmm. did. I mean, that came late in my life and I can see the impact it has on my day to day and how I have to, I have to, you know, intentionally uh, mm -hmm. not allow it to affect mm -hmm. my self-worth and my, you know, I can't doubt what and how I do things, but they got their whole life ahead of them dealing with this. Mm -hmm. And it, it is, I mean, think about the NIL space that we're dealing with in college football. It's all about promoting your name and getting likes and getting people to, I mean, that's, it's, it's good and worse. It's definitely not getting better. It's getting harder, not easier. And it is affecting people in ways that, that, that we never thought it could. Um, it, it's, it's one of the reasons that I just felt so compelled to have you on. Um, I, I'm not sure there is a person leading a college football team that that's, that's more immersed right now in in what this is and and i just thought your voice right while you're going through it because if we can't help these kids truly see what what and why they're valued and yes we're playing a game yes that's important but does that define does the outcome define who they are and it's the same for you and i and that answer is no it doesn't define who we are no. it defines maybe how we performed in that small scale in that window of time against that opponent of an entire lifetime of things, but then really how we respond to that is the defining moment um, and, and helping us become. And so leaders that have the ability and the foresight to have uh, been through this amazing challenge are lucky now to have these young people uh, to try to, to see things more clearly, right? In a time that we've never seen, as you mentioned, name, image, and likeness. And then if things get difficult, I'm going to leave this place and go to another place. Yeah. Uh, and, and staying to go through challenges and learn and contribute, but maybe even more serve, right? Not be served, but to truly serve and add value yes. and put something else first. Team, right? Football is a team game. Family is a yeah. team game, right? Life is a team game. You're, you're to give and contribute and to serve. And that whole thing, I don't hear those words mentioned much. It's what do I get? What's yeah. my what's mine and what, and so this idea of giving and serving, I've never felt better than giving and serving someone else. I've it never is. ever felt better. And I've yeah. never felt worse than expecting and feeling entitled to get. And, yeah. and hopefully we can somehow navigate this in this world of college sport as a vehicle with basically an entire culture that seems to be kind of right in the middle of these things that you're, that you're right in the middle of as well. Yeah. Right. You know, our, our, uh, our top core value, we have three core values that we, we have as a team is selfless. And mm -hmm. I didn't come up with a definition. I stole it from a good friend. 
that does this for a living. And the, the, the definition is take strength from our teammates and act in the best interest of the family, of the program at all times. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of days I just say, hey, man, how are you taking strength from your teammates, man? How, how are you taking strength from, your, from the guy right next to you? How are you, how are you serving him? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's mm-hmm. really what it is. And, and mm-hmm. society and, and, and the world culture is complete opposite of that. Get mm-hmm. all I can get, get mine. You know, what am I getting? The recruiting process is complete opposite of that. Uh, and so continuing that message every day, how are mm-hmm. you taking strength from the guy next to you? How are you serving the guy mm-hmm. next to you? How are you serving the community that supports us? I mean, it's a constant message that got to keep hearing. And we've got to keep living it visibly so they see an example of what that looks like. Um yeah. And I think it's only going to get harder. It's only going to get harder and more important. Well, and, and the, the divisions that are happening uh, in sport are, are really financially driven, right? And, and what can be what can be got and what can be got, I, mean, I know I'm not using great English, is the money, right? And so yeah. reality is that the example I prefer, and I do it imperfectly, um, but right, um, our best example just went about doing good. His whole life was just doing yeah. good. Yeah. And, and really, if we can somehow know that you can play this game and compete at a fierce and competitive, and you really value the outcome. However, what you're really valued by is how you serve and doing good and seeing those things clearly and healthily, right? I, I think then, wait, football becomes a pretty powerful thing. Yeah. If, if not that, what are we really doing? And and so, Brian, I know you've just kind of been listening to two old friends just talk the whole time. Um, but that's what happens on meaningful topics and, and and people that are passionate about trying to make a difference. As imperfectly as we do it, the intent is genuine, right? The intent is authentic. And we we have shortcomings as leaders that everybody sees. But I think if our players see those shortcomings and we acknowledge them, yep, <laughs> I totally screwed that up. Yeah, it makes I think some of the most powerful everything. things you can do, Bron. I think some of the most powerful things you can do is stand yep. in front of your team and your staff and say, "Look, I yep. messed up." Totally. I mean, acknowledge it. Look, I make mistakes. Whether it's in a game, whether it's a decision you made, whether it's a disciplinary action you took, and you see it on the back end, and say, "Look, hey guys, I screwed up. I'm yep. sorry. I'm human. I messed up. Guess what? I'm going to be better next time." Yep. It's one of the most powerful things you can do because we're not perfect and we do. But if we won't acknowledge, if we won't get out of our own way and acknowledge when we make a mistake, uh, then, then we got no chance of of maintaining credibility and trust from yeah. the guys underneath us and in the room. And some of the most powerful things I've done along the way is when I just flat missed it and, and, and step up and, and said, guys, hey, my fault. I'm going to be transparent with it. This was a mistake. This was not the right decision. This was not the right reaction. Hey, I apologize for the way I delivered this. You know, I've asked forgiveness for my, hey, my temper and my language got the best of me. That's not who God wants me to be in front of you guys. And it is powerful because I, I, I think it energizes the group to realize, hey, man, he's, he's, he's one of us. He really is truly authentic. He truly is letting us behind the curtain. And, and I think it, I think it energizes your ability to lead and even you know more deeply. I think it does. And, and the other thing that I'll tell a quick story, but the, the, the faster we acknowledge that, I like to call it swift and certain. The, the sooner I make a mistake, the faster I can acknowledge it in front of everyone, especially those I offended in some way, the more that we then can progress and, and learn from it and go. And the more that you wait, and sometimes you have to process it, right? Before you realize it was a mistake. But man, as soon as you realize it, then claim it and own it before you move forward. And my dad, I grew up in the horse business as well. And when you're in cu- working with cutting horses, they're low to the ground. And sometimes when you turn, dirt and rocks get in your boots because they they turn and you know your pant leg comes up and I'd be and you get off and you have to go up to the barn to get another one. And you try to rock or walk with a rock in your boot, and it hurts your feet. And and he'd see yeah. me kind of limp and he would just say, Stop and get the rock out. And I've used that a lot of just addressing things in my life, mistakes that I've made. Stop. As fast as you feel that, that pebble in there that's hurting your foot, stop, shake out your boot, fix it, 
and then go on. And because, yeah, it hurts when you keep walking with something in there that you could just stop and address. Um, and so acknowledging those mistakes as fast as possible allows growth for everybody. Um, yeah. And I just, Blake, I just so appreciate you coming on and just the insight and, and just willingness to share with all of us. And um, I just, uh, uh, I'm grateful for the example, but grateful for the willingness and hopefully other leaders, right, that um, this can impact and help them in some way, right? Just add some sense of balance. That doesn't mean they don't want to win, but we're talking about the development of young people and issues that are real. And, and I hope they could have learned or taken something away and just from your willingness to share today. So I, I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate y'all having me. I don't, I know we didn't script it. We just shared and hopefully God shined through and some folks are going to pay attention and maybe it's going to help somebody along the way. Uh, with young leaders on their way up, who knows, maybe an old dog, maybe learns a new trick or two. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate the time. Love you to death, man. appreciate your friendship, the text messages that you send me always seem to hit when I didn't eat them most. Um, hey man, I'm still, I'm still walking with a limp a little bit when people watch and see me, I hope they give me some grace knowing I'm, I'm figuring out how to deal with this too. Uh, yeah. this is not where I thought I would be in my life. Uh, never thought I'd be a head coach. Definitely didn't think I'd be sharing a testimony about losing a wife and losing a son to suicide, but that's where God's got me. And I know God is faithful and will use it. I appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to share and just use the platform. Absolutely, uh, Blake. We really appreciate it. I mean, that was just a, a phenomenal conversation. And hopefully, like you said, uh, somebody out there can can at least take something away from this that they can use uh, within their own programs or, or within their own life. I know Utah State in, in the past has uh, run a mental health week surrounding your game at UNLV. Hopefully others uh, will, will pick up on that trend and, and, and encourage everybody to start talking about mental health. We, we didn't even get into uh, you taking over the Aggies there and, and guiding them from one win to 11. The first time anybody in the FBS has done that. But uh, that, that'll be a time for another podcast. I think it, it was just great to have you on and we certainly appreciate it and good luck the rest of the season as you get into the thick of mountain west play appreciate it we're gonna to try to make a run of it absolutely we know you will so we'll, we'll catch you on next week on uh head coach you uh, a big thank you to our sponsor college war room uh for bronco mendenhall and blake anderson i'm brian fisher thanks everybody